Uh, I'm Tanita Tetsky, Dean of Libraries, and it's really a pleasure to welcome you to our event today. It launches this uh, academic year season, and this, according to our count, and we're not off this record keepers, uh, this is the 19th one since we started, introduces the, introduced this tradition in 2011. And from one a few years ago, we were talking who went to all of them, and I believe that gentleman is going to university, but some of you are probably approaching that pretty well. So scholarship is an event series that's part of the library's key strategic goals uh, to connect members of the campus community to scholarship. I, also, I want to say I'm really here to connect you to a civic scholar, but I, I find it hard now to say the word scholarship with us. <laughs> anyway, it's a social setting uh, with food for thought, which we will introduce here in a minute, discussions uh, and the like about some cross-disciplinary research, and more importantly, a toast to the end of the academic year, the term. So before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items I want to share. So first, I'm pleased to say we are once again recording and streaming our presentation live and online anywhere on campus. Uh, we're not sure. I think you said we don't have anybody logged in yet. Oh, we suddenly have three. Maybe yeah. they logged in uh -huh. at 5 o'clock. So welcome, folks. And I know there's some of our friends from education who've driven three and a half hours and you wanted to wave to them because you waved to them. This is an <laughs> online, <laughs> online faculty member who said, I'm going to come in person. And so she made the track, which is rather impressive. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing it. Um, so we welcome our viewers online. And really, I hope you've got uh, something to sip as you join us. And we won't ask what that is. So we have another event coming up. I want to be sure to uh, mention to you. And that's our annual Celebrating Drexel Authors yeah. event. Many of you are familiar with this. This event recognizes our colleagues who have authored or edited books published in 2017, this, this calendar year. So we're still working to finalize the date and time, but it's probably sometime in spring. But meanwhile, if you if you want to send your citation information to, we have a chance to introduce Stacey Stanislaw, our communication manager, as well as uh, Sarah Rich, one of our assistants, and they really deserve all the thanks for keeping this thing organized and bring you the best selection of our jerks. So thank you both for doing it. And of course, I want to remind you that our Winter Scholarship event, for which we'll be back, for those of you who have come before, to the Academic Bistro, uh, will be held on March 19th. We can mark your calendars for that. Um, not that we're upset, but our, one of our best uh, attendees for people from uh, nursing, CMHP, and they're having their holiday party in the, in the bistro at this very time. I said, how could they have missed that? Because they so much. So we were, well, I understand, because now the bistro reports to them, so that's understandable. But anyway, we'll be back there. But this is really a very lovely setting as well. So this year, in each of our three scholarship events, we decided to focus them around a common theme. So get a load of this theme. Research matters. Everything else seems to matter in this life. So connecting Drexel to global scholarship. Uh, we want to use this year's event series to raise the conversation about the issues and relationship between scholarship and what it means to provide access to research. It's one of our key areas. So during each event this year, the three events, we'll have a Drexel professor who will reflect on how the dissemination of research through publication is critical to the development of knowledge in a particular field. So today we kick off the year with our first guest speaker, Man, I'm pleased to introduce, but really doesn't need much of an introduction, I think, Professor Yuri Gagatsi. So if you don't know him, Professor Gagatsi is a distinguished university professor and trustee chair in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at Drexel University. He also holds courtesy appointments in the Departments of Chemistry and Mechanical Engineering and Mechanics at Drexel. And he serves as director of the A.J. Drexel Nanotechnology Institute. He has co-authored two books, edited 13 books, and obtained more than 40 patents, and authored more than 300 peer-evaluated papers, including more than 10 papers in science and nature families and journals. So his research has been recognized with numerous awards, and he has had, he's been elected as the Fellow of the American Ceramic Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Materials Research Society, just to name a few. But since I forgot the page on the back side of the first page, I want to tell you a little bit about this series. Uh, I printed this, you know, saving paper with the two sides. So um, our series, this, this is important to say sort of how we picked it. It's part of a research university's core responsibility to generate scholarly outputs. 
and to position those outputs well within the global communication landscape. <clears throat> so the more accessible research is, here's the theory, the more the accessible research is, the more likely it is to be used and cited by other researchers, which enhances the researcher's reputation, but also that of the institution over time. So today, the idea of publish or perish doesn't apply to just individual researchers. Higher education continues to be challenged to share new knowledge or perish as a research player. So research data, publications, citations are all integral to the success of the university as an organization. And it's imperative that Drexel promotes its scholarly outputs to a global audience as we strive to become this comprehensive research university. But capturing and dissemination, disseminating uh, information, faculty, staff, and student research output, it's not that easy. Our library staff are always looking for new ways to help faculty, staff, and student researchers navigate the scholarly communication landscape to publish and to expose the research institution's uh, outputs. So institutional repositories makes this easier, and we're rather excited to soon have, one of the things we're proud to say this year, all theses and dissertations that are pro produced by our youngest scholars available through electronic deposit and open, therefore, for user retrieval. Hopefully this will be by the spring, the end of, of the second every year. So 2017-18 scholarship, draw, the series draws on people who recognize the importance of scholarship in for both Drexel and the global community, and who are heavily involved in research and publishing. Our speakers were first recognized at our annual Celebrating Drexel Authors event last year for being named in the top worldwide 1% by citations in their field by Clarivet Analytics 2016 highly cited researchers list. And just a little word on that, since I've already introduced you, see why he's part of this. To compile the 2016 list, <clears throat> Clarivate Analytics looked at highly cited papers published in the last decade, and last year they chose 2004 through 2014, and identified authors whose papers rank in the top 1% by the number of citations to their work in each of their 22 subject fields. This analysis named more than 3,000 researchers with global influence in 2016. So I'm very proud to say, as we looked at this, that four of them are Drexel researchers. Yuri Gagatsi, Anna V. Dizias Ro, Gordon Richards, and Peter DeCarlo. So we invited the top three from this list to speak as one of our each of our three scholarship events this year. So before I now turn it over to Yuri, or as I say, it doesn't need further one, there's a, um, there's a certain, before I turn the podium, there's a certain tradition we have to do here. So I'd like to invite you to raise your glasses in toast to the end of the fall 2017, it's what it is, term. For those of you that still had papers or exams to grade, have a sip, and as you're doing it, think about being kind to your students. You just give them that A or A minus if you have to show variation. And let's say, good for the end of this term. <laughs> Well, Danuta, thank you very much for this kind of introduction. Can you hear me back uh, in the back of the room? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Very good. So, I'm going to talk about uh, many different things today. But, first of all, why do we publish? It's really for us a currency of our profession. People tell publish or perish uh, in engineering and sciences because while we are uh, paid for teaching nine months a year, no one gets promotion in engineering or sciences just for teaching in major research universities here. And really, when I, um, I talk to high school kids uh, coming, considering Drexel and or freshman uh, students, and ask them, what is the difference between a university professor and a high school teacher? We all teach, we all transfer our knowledge. And actually, high school teachers probably have a more difficult job because we get the best of the best coming uh, to universities. And I tell them, the key difference is that we also generate new knowledge here at the university. We don't only take knowledge from textbooks and put it in someone's brains, we produce knowledge. And if we produce knowledge, we publish it. And of course the challenge is how to present it in the way that also people can understand it. Delivering a clear message about science here. So how we communicate our research. 
And it's not necessarily always easy. And I'm sure many people here in the room have experience of writing papers. And we have written actually more than 500 of them here. And I know it's a cutting off, for whatever reason, the lower part of the screen. Uh, it tells basically most scientists regarding the new streamlined peer review process is quite an improvement <laughs> and it's tough. And we all get our papers rejected. I co-authored more than 500 papers. I'm an associate editor of one of the leading journals and I get my papers rejected also by the journal for which I am an editor. So reaching that goal at the end is not necessarily always uh, easy, but it's possible. What is also interesting, this is actually a slide I got from uh, Alistair Saunders, and again, stuff at the bottom, unfortunately, will be probably cut off in many cases here. It shows how Drexel has been actually growing its scholarly uh, production here. And I'm not sure why these things, two declines happen. I joined Drexel in the year 2000. <laughs> but, uh, it's always dangerous to build a wrong association. <laughs> this sharp in uh, crease, and actually it's really very sharp. It's certainly related not uh, to myself becoming part of the Drexel industry, but to the fact that I think at that moment the administration, Dike Kropodakis, Dean of Engineering, Celtic Gutierrez, many other people took course on really transforming Drexel to a major research university. People like myself uh, were hired, people who have been here were also given course to really focus more on research production, bringing graduate school students, building and strengthening graduate education in Drexel here. And it's really a very, very uh, healthy, very, very uh, significant growth. And as you see, and this is actually data that I got from Alistair. Uh, you guys may have uh, more updated data in the library and 2015. But again, I would say uh, the growth has been very noticeable. Moreover, this is another slide taken from Alistair. I'm just wondering. Uh, yeah, it's probably a different, slightly different uh, uh, display uh, size here. But it talks about. Uh, I cannot even here see my computer for, uh, oh, okay, it's probably like here. But basically, those are just papers that Alistair analyzed by the field. And my uh, main activities are in material science, nanotechnology, material chemistry. And you look at the number of papers from Drexel, material science actually, along with probably neurosciences, made two largest segments. So I'm publishing in this area, I'm publishing in chemistry, I'm publishing nanoscience, nanotechnology here, and a little bit probably physics, multidisciplinary chemistry. So if you look at these areas, you clearly see where Drexel is uh, productive truly here. It's uh, chemical materials, nanosciences, and of course medical sciences, particularly neurosciences, clinical neurology, biochemistry, molecular biology. It gives you an idea, surgery where uh, the production is output here. And in fact, if you look at the list of most cited papers from Drexel University, you will see that uh, a number of them deal with, again, electrochemistry, our work. Uh, they deal actually a very strong uh, group in physics uh, that those are large papers coming from many, many groups here. But they deal with medical science. And you can continue this list here. Uh, so what is attracting most of attention and leads to many citations. And uh, Clary Wade, uh, which uh, purchased uh, a Web of Science from Institute of Scientific Information or purchased Institute of Scientific Information, uh, analyzed those results, looking at this highly cited paper in the field and hot papers in the field, which are basically 0.01% of most cited in two years. We actually have five of those uh, now, uh, with about six tests in highly cited 59, as I looked last time here. They produce this list that Danuta was talking about, and people you will hear are actually uh, scientists who are from the list of Drexel. You actually mentioned last year's list. On this year, uh, Drexel still has four positions, uh, but we got a position in material science and chemistry, and uh, Peter uh, and uh, Anna uh, have two others. Again, 
What does it mean? There are a lot of great researchers, excellent scientists, who may simply be publishing high quality paper, just smaller numbers. And I would say, if someone is not on this list, it doesn't mean that these people don't do good research. Uh, it's maybe possible to publish one important paper, which may be more important than a hundred of lesser important. But its summary tells us um, it means that the volume of research and its citations, so it means someone values it. If someone say uh, cited our paper uh, more than uh, whatever we got seven thousand times, and it's a probably close to nine thousand in Google Scholar, it means that this work really made an impact. So I think uh, this is how we need to look at these numbers here. Something that affected the field. So now, four positions among more than 3,000. Is it good or bad? It's a question of always here. Let's give an example. Entire Russia, which is actually known for strong science paper, has three. Moreover, if you look at this listing, only one person is really working in Russia. Two others have Russia, it's a Russian or scientists have originated from Russia. And the actually Russian universities for the affiliate is like a, their third affiliation. So they have a project and uh, adjunct position there somewhere here. So it shows you Drexel alone had produced more impactful publications in the entire country of Russia. I'm originally of Ukraine. Unfortunately, Ukrainian scientists did not make this list. It shows something. However, our big neighbor, and it's actually among few universities like Stanford, Harvard, Cambridge, that have actually more than 20 scientists on the list here. And you see, they have actually, you don't see it here, they have three pages with totally all together 26 people. And actually you will not be surprised to see that they're strong in economics, business, social sciences, and medical sciences because of a huge school. The good thing for us, there's no one in material science in the public school department. There's one person in chemistry, Chris Murray, just like I address uh, myself. Yeah. So, it means that we are competitive in certain fields, and certainly very strong, and they are actually, again, one of the largest, longest list here. And of course, people who achieve this and reach this, it's not me writing papers day and night. Those are really PhD students and postdocs in my group, plus numerous collaborators around the world. This is a team effort. And I think this is something what is important change in modern uh, science writing, communication, compared to something like a 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, because uh, people used to have a PhD advisor and a student writing a paper. Now many papers have 10 authors. That's why we can have like a dozens of papers published uh, in a year, because everyone contributes. If you divide by the number of authors, it becomes still a few papers per person. But we do things that are interdisciplinary. We have people who do different type of experiments and modeling, and coming from different fields, we publish with medical doctors, we publish with physicists, we publish with others here. And Katie, you are not here already, or are you still here? She's there. Okay, so uh, Katie uh, is my former student. She graduated, uh, she works uh, at Drexel, for Drexel now, uh, and okay. Uh, she's right here in this picture, well, shortly before uh, her uh, graduation. Uh, so uh, she moved to stuff here. So those are really people to credit. It's a teamwork. You cannot just produce this number of publication without large research teams. And if you look at people who are actually like a, a more cited in our field, people who are uh, at the top, like a George White side, doesn't have more than 1,000 papers in publication, they have sometimes research groups going up to a hundred of students and postdocs. Very, very large research teams here. Just to give you an idea of what we are doing. My research is in the field of, as I mentioned already, material science, materials engineering, nanoscience, uh, material chemistry, electric chemistry. But it's broad on one hand. It's broad in terms of 
material simplification. But if you look at this, you will find a lot of carbon, carbon nanotubes, diamond nanoparticles, onion-like carbons, porous carbon nanotubes, all carbons, graphene. We discovered with my colleague, Professor Michel Barzum, a new family of two-dimensional materials, carbides and nitrides. They're like a graphene, but built of multiple atoms, and we produce more than 30 of them, predicted millions, and it's a really fun field to explore. But what we do after this, we have new materials. Materials are like a building block. Whatever we wear is made of materials. Your computer scaffolds, all made of materials. Moreover, you have this uh, super smart cell phones uh, that uh, connect for us as computer sources of communication, information. Uh, you can take pictures, you don't need to bring your camera anymore because of new materials. They basically enable new technologies. And what we do? ourselves and these collaborators. We explore. We use them, for example, for delivering drug particles. We use them for poking single cells, nanotubes like micro syringes. We use them for removing salt from water, producing drinking water. Storing energy, supercapacitors, I will talk about them in the later <coughs> today, or batteries. Yeah. And we do a lot of basic science. We really do publish a lot of uh, uh, papers in top journals like the Nature Family Journal, Science, others. But we're trying also to bring it to commercialization. We've got a couple of R&D 100 awards, uh, non-tech briefs for bringing technology to commercialization. Katie uh, is working now for a startup company in bringing Drexel technology to the real world here. And I think we start companies like Y Carbon, we work with big corporations, international corporations. So, because we want to see results coming out of research. So, what we see is related, what we do is related to carbon nanomaterials, nanomaterials in general. Actually, second edition of this nanomaterials book was published just like a month ago. Uh, so, uh, feel free to invite me <laughs> uh, to your publications. Event this was, was published last year, and again, also the second edition. And this material is used for either energy or health care application materials. But we are venturing into water, we are venturing into lasers, many, many other fields nowadays, again, in collaboration with colleagues that know more than that. And what is exciting here, we really make discoveries sometimes. Uh, as I already mentioned, this family of materials, this atomic layer sandwiches, where different colors show different atoms. For example, like titanium, molybdenum, titanium bonded by carbon. We call them amoxins because M stands for the transition metal in this uh, structure and X stands for carbon nitrogen. But moreover, graphene is like a very much known today, like a magical uh, material that can do almost everything. Maxine pretty much in every single product. Graphene nowadays. And there was this article published by a science journalist, Mitch Jacobi, who is a professional science writer for chemical engineering news. This is a bulletin of American Chemical Society that boasts about 170,000 members every week here. He, like, I talked to all researchers working in the field of two dimensional materials. What is next after graphene in two D materials? More graphene, here come other interesting materials. This is a cover of the journal. This is a picture of Maxim, produced by uh, my uh, researcher, Sir Babak and Suri. This article opens with a picture of Maxim. You can draw a conclusion. Something was discovered here at Drexel. It's considered to be now the most promising family of materials in general. And it's very nice because they become really at the forefront of research, and there are more than already uh, about 300 uh, institutions in 37 countries, according to our last count, that published on this new material family here. So this brings satisfaction, and of course, the whole site research that we did at Drexel University. So this is where this citation, this impact comes uh, from. And, uh, and again, I know that many of you are not material scientists, not chemists, uh, uh, and I don't want to get you bored here. But also, you know, like a kind of a funny structure you can build. So we can make materials now build them atom by atoms. 
And depending on how we arrange these different uh, colorful spheres, these balls in the structures, we get very different properties. And that's all about here. You need some materials which are great conductors, some are dielectric, some semiconductors. Some of them need to be very strong, flexible, some of them need to be soft and pliable. And when we can build them by atom by atoms, we can basically give them properties that we need for those applications. And that's fun. And we order it like in 2015, Babaka Nasuri, who is a assistant professor in my group, he shows that we can make this sandwich-like structure when one atomic layer is on the surface, another is in the middle, or you can have a sandwich with a somewhat thicker layer. Uh, this is a double burger uh, in this case, uh, but an atomic one. Right so it's really uh, fun building the structures, playing with them. But what is important, they already start finding numerous applications. Well, Drexel University already licensed the technology uh, to companies and we actually expect those products are uh, hitting the market uh, next uh, year. The company is starting to market them. And applications are very broad. They go from electromagnetic interference shield, uh, what basically in every phone computers uh, prevent noise. So when uh, you bring the microphones, they're very close to uh, the another micro computer, you still this noise here. Uh, when you are uh, uh, stuck in a car and you see a uh, radio cranky, or you come with your cell phone or uh, computer to a TV, uh, you again see cranky noise. This whole electromagnetic shield is that you can suppress with vaccines better than with any other material in the world. They store energy in supercapacitor and batteries. They can be used for water purification and many, many other applications. Actually, treat cancer, uh, destroy cancerous tumors here. And this is fun because, again, a lot of people get into the field, they follow up, they continue publishing papers here. And we work on energy storage, uh, and again, I don't want to go into details, but this plot shows, Ragoni plot, like a specific energy, it's like if your car battery can see how far you can go in a single charge. And specific power shows how well it can accelerate. So supercapacitor, we work on making this material, like a battery on steroids. You can charge them within a second. So this range here, trying to give them. We're trying to give them more power that can run for a longer time. And we can make them of materials like carbon, which are environmentally friendly, can be recycled easily, or simply incinerated without producing toxic residues. And this supercaps actually already, uh, SEPTA uh, has actually very powerful model. So when SEPTA trains, uh, suburban trains break, all the energy get stored by very, very large supercapacitor. So those are devices that article uh, on electrochemical capacitors that were cited more than 7,000 times, turn the field around and pretty much help to shape this field here. It's used here by SEPTA. You don't see it, you don't have it in uh, your cell phone, and you will uh, very soon. Uh, but it's something that uh, wakes computer up and hibernates already supercapacitor, and that market is growing huge from about 100,000, 100 millions uh, 10 years ago to about 2 billions last year. And it's projected to go about 30, 40 billions in the next few years. They help to recover energy, saving 30% energy for trains, trams. You go to Shanghai, you go to many other Chinese cities. There are buses like this, they get charged at every bus stop. Just in the time that people get off the bus and on the bus, because it's like a very quickly chargeable battery. And it goes to the next stop. And you don't need wires, you don't need rails, you basically charge the very bus stop. And this is something actually, I think, demonstration of how our future will look like. Green, green independent, things here. What you see here in the picture is the bus stop actually in Japan. And the picture will be a few years old. There are two LED lights powering a light on bus stop. There are solar panels on the roof. And here, there is a supercapacitor module. What is nice about the system? It's a warranted maintenance free for 10 years. You assemble, you put anywhere, and you have power for providing light with no maintenance, no nothing, with sunshine coming during the day, providing light during the night. So we have similar setup in every home, everywhere here. This is what gives us energy safety, 
what will allow us to burn much less uh, uh, oil and uh, gas and coal and will provide a clean, clean future. So we're trying to develop materials that make it happen. It goes in different dimensions. We work with uh, Genevieve Dion uh, uh, from um, Newcomand um, and she's leading uh, a new large initiative on advanced functional fabrics of America for Rupert Drexel and uh, she's one of the leader in industrial textiles, smart textiles. So we're working on making fibers that can be incorporated into textile to store energy, produce energy, transmit energy, and basically enable those textiles uh, with you. And there are many, many other very, very exciting things that can be done with materials. And of course, whenever we open a new field, we publish a paper. Sometimes we patent in parallel, but we always publish. And this results, if you do something really new, if we open a venue of research, get cited. That's how basically drugs or research gets high level of citations goes to prominence. Now, there are many other things happening around this. We do research, but we also teach, we discover, we transfer technology, we do many of other things. And of course, some people write papers, someone else need to also edit those papers, review those papers. And this is actually a large part also of our job. I review papers for at least 20 different journals every year. But I'm also acting as associate editor for this journal, which is called ACS Nano. It's American Chemical Society journal. And actually, you see a cover article uh, which published uh, our work on this layer in materials, Maxine, that I mentioned to you. What is interesting? This journal, if you look at the Google, Google Scholar Index, which basically summarizes number of citation over last five years and determines which one produced more papers, more citation for papers. It is in top 20 across all the fields. Uh, so it gets a lot of papers. This journal gets uh, about uh, 900 submissions every month. We publish about 100 papers every month. You can easily calculate what is the rejection level. And I handle every week probably about a dozen of manuscripts. Uh, it varies from 10 to 15 uh, for this journal. So I go through a very large number of papers every week, not only as author, author and papers, but also as editor. And so many other people in our community serve as editor for different journals, enable publications. So this is another very, very important part of the publication activities here because someone uses there are journals that publish for profit uh, organization like Elsevier, but they still usually have editors who are professional scientists. Valid journals, nature family journals, they have professional editors, but they still of course engage a lot of scientists as editorial board members, as reviewers. So this is all this, this system and process you start to Another activity we go beyond. We're also trying to look at science and scientific product as a way of educating, as a way of bringing uh, beauty, greatness of science to communities that always beyond researchers, scientists, engineers like myself, like a number of people in this room. Uh, in 2016, we started a nano artography competition. Uh, we got uh, uh, more than 100 submissions in the first uh, year. Those are some of the pictures. Uh, we uh, raised uh, funds uh, to, uh, and Babak and Asuri, uh, actually from my group, was the one who launched the activity. We raised funds to give prizes up to $700 to people who submit the most beautiful pictures. Uh, we publish our uh, Jefferson Nano Materials Institute calendar. That also includes the best images here. And people can vote online. And I think it was like 100,000 votes uh, going for it uh, here. And we had a new competition this year. You can find it. It just finished actually the gift prizes here. And this was a second prize uh, winner last year in an 2016 here. 
This picture was selected by World Science Festival in New York last May as one of their uh, uh, cover images. Uh, and they claim that about 3 million people visited their website. So again, this type of a scientific image is uh, Ariana uh, Levitt, uh, who is a PhD student uh, in my group. She did this work actually with Caroline Schauer and other faculty uh, from our department, uh, also affiliated with the chemistry department, I believe, Caroline. Uh, here. Uh, she produces pictures of nice fibers that got this attention. And uh, she clearly like a, <coughs> I got huge visibility because of this work. And I think this is again important um, in the US compared to many other countries. Science and engineering are much less appreciated by media. I travel a lot around the world. I go probably to more than a dozen of different countries every year. I spend maybe 30-40% of my time traveling everywhere here. And I go and I see on front pages of London Times, front of the reminder, newspaper in China or Singapore, articles about science, new discoveries, new research. You rarely if ever see on the front page of USA Today uh, or other newspaper. <laughs> New York Times uh, maybe does a little bit better than such here. CNN closed their science division like a more than a decade ago, and the staff actually rehired the number of people there. So I think we also need to work, and this is where libraries do a great job, spreading the word about the importance of science and engineering for our society, for community, for progress, for prosperity that we are enjoying in the US here. And I think it's very important, and activities like that help to make science advances more accessible to general public. Something people can enjoy, see the beauty of this work here. This year, actually, we took it a little bit further. Also, uh, running a competition science and video with help of the $10,000 grant from Materials Society. Again, there are prices going up to $1,000. When people can take their cell phone, a two-minute video, and compete here, and actually awards were given at Materials Society meeting uh, just uh, uh, a week ago uh, for this one. So there is again a way to take all this beautiful science, all this great scientific discoveries to broader public here, and we're trying to spread uh, this information as much as we can. And actually this was my, or this is my very, very last uh, slide. I don't want to uh, get uh, anyone bored here. And I know there are a lot of uh, holiday parties going on and I'm uh, competing, I was already told, and there's a party in nursery <laughs> and probably other places here. But I think producing knowledge is really great. I love it personally. This is my also, not just a job, this is my hobby. Uh, that's why I read papers, I write papers all the time. That's why we are really information junkies. We uh, need information, we need easy access to uh, everything that gets published and we're talking to a library, uh, how we can uh, get it back on track because it became more difficult in the last few months, there are more barriers uh, and uh, well, I was struggling last time about two hours ago trying to get the latest paper because we're trying to be at the edge all the time. Uh, timing Novelty are absolutely critical in what we are doing. Uh, since here. And again, we would not be able to get access to information without this access to knowledge. And this may be the reason why scientists and scientists like Russia and others, they don't necessarily have a luxury of subscribing to all the publications they need. Having access to cutting edge research, uh, fall behind and trail behind uh, research communities, well, other places. And uh, the other uh, way around is people in countries which become, became rich recently, like Saudi Arabia, countries that started to invest enormous amount of money and uh, part of the uh, GDP into research like China, right away increased their research output dramatically here because all these things are interconnected. And they're all important, but again, even if you produce great knowledge, what 
was happening in the former Soviet Union that I'm from in China before, but it gets published in Russian, Chinese language, in journals which are not accessible to anyone. There is very little usage. But if we do our best job to publish it in good places where people can notice, then it's much easier to get access to information nowadays. If we see more access, free access to information, uh, scientific progress will basically come on much, much faster, hopefully to the benefit of uh, the society and everyone else. And with this, I'm going to stop. I will be glad to answer any questions. Uh, and again, thank you very much uh, for spending uh, Monday night uh, listening to my talk. since it's a non-engineering community as well, so I'll stick to the beautiful images that you share. Could you go back to the one that received the second place award? No. Uh, it looks like you have a different absorption spectra of this type of material, and you have kind of the fibrous material that are uh, over micron. In mm -hmm. Dimensions. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about this in terms of uh, design? Well, uh, actually, Ariana works on electricity. Uh, but here, this was just a, a regular carbon fiber yarn, which is just made this way. But what we're trying to do, we're trying to make smart fibers actually with uh, specific optical properties. Maxines have different electronic properties and definitely different absorption properties. They absorb in different wavelength ranges here. So some of them visible wave range, some of them absorb in infrared. And this is, for example, what uh, scientists they use, and actually uh, we uh, lost the priority in that field. Uh, we had an idea, but by the time we built collaboration with Fox Chase, Chinese researcher only published a couple of papers. They use it to destroy tumors uh, because by simply illuminating this infrared light a tumor, under they can inject material into the tumor, and infrared light will hit selectively this material. So whenever the material is injected, you can raise the temperature to 50, 60 degrees C and kill the tumor. This is called the photothermal therapy. We use it for surface enhanced trauma spectroscopy because there are surface plasmons, again, sorry for uh, technical terminology, <laughs> uh, but it's like a uh, surface uh, electron wave vibration that allows, to, for example, determine very small amount, few molecules on the surface of these materials or between the layers. Uh, so there are a lot of fun things that can be done here. And we're trying really, you know, really mostly we're trying to make these materials. People like electrical engineering, biomedical engineering, look usually for applications of those here. Our job is to tell, look, this is what you have. And this is, you tell us what you need, and we can design it for you. So this is how we approach it. Yes, please. When you review the papers, are most of them in English, or what languages? Pretty much, we publish all of our papers in English. I don't remember when I wrote last paper in Russian or German. Uh, I had initially published here. And let me tell you, I come originally from uh, Ukraine. But at the time I left Ukraine uh, in uh, 1990, it was still part of the former Soviet Union. And I went to Germany as a humble fellow. And in the Soviet Union, you actually were discouraged publishing and writing paper in English. And you had to publish it in Russian first before you would be allowed to send it. And I talked to my German advisor, professor advisor, and asked him, look, I know there are so many great studies that were published in German in the past. Uh, when do you publish in German? How often do you publish in German? And his answer was never. If, and his explanation was this, I was surprised. And he explained that, look, if my work is really good, I want to publish it in the language that everyone can read. And if it's not good, why to publish it? So, and I think this was a very, very important message for me. There is still information published in local languages often for technical communities, for businesses, for companies, for not necessarily everyone's 
But if you talk about science, really, English simply became nowadays the language of scientific communications. And here. So that's why we write and publish everything in English. This is particularly interesting for me because my other life, I work for a multilingual communications mm -hmm. company. And our scientific clients are routinely sending us papers to publish the English. Mm -hmm. For example, <laughs> because also, you know, like, especially if you aim for high profile journals, the presentation should be written in English that people can understand. It should be written well, it should be written very, very clearly. And this becomes so very often. People can produce good research, but if they cannot write a good paper, they cannot deliver the message, the message often gets lost. So good work, poorly presented, is simply often indistinguishable from poor work. So it becomes really important, and this is something that uh, hinders the ability of uh, researchers in some countries where uh, English has not been really taught uh, from the beginning at school, uh, from again breaking to the world uh, uh, market and delivering their messages here. So it's truly uh, very, very important uh, nowadays. In spite of all the automated translation on Google uh, Translate and other things, you really need to write. And often I think it really depends on clarity in mind. I had uh, Foreign students and postdocs who would write a great, great paper. I had students uh, who, for whom English was their first language, and they just cannot put their thoughts on paper uh, in a clear way together. So I think it's also important not just be able to uh, know English well, but again, being able to express thoughts, organize thoughts on paper. And this is uh, when people deeply understand, they can explain uh, what they have. Um. So I, I have a question for you. So what's coming up now is another uh, format of communicating the research output, and that's the data itself, mm -hmm. the raw data itself. Mm -hmm. we're, we're struggling now, and not just here, but everywhere, with this question, how do we organize, make it discoverable, describe, preserve, and have, you know, we're, we're looking at different ways to look at that raw data. And as you know, there's many, Otherwise, there's a number of our funding agencies now that require that if you have federal funding, that you make it available for this. So, how have you tackled that in your institute? Uh, and what do you need to make it easier? You know, actually, I'm quite skeptical about it, mm -hmm. as, as way as about uh, many activities that federal agencies do. <laughs> because the problem is, for example, they require you to make all the data available. Well. But why not giving you any money to do it? And it's work. They say, look, uh, publish open access. It's great. But publish in nature communication costs $5,000. Uh, American Chemical Society about $3,000 per paper. Oh, no, sorry, we don't have money for publications when you write a proposal to this. So I think there is a large first mismatch between this ideal wish, make everything available, and the question is how to make it available. Second, Real challenge we have, I believe, is not that we don't have enough data. The problem is we have too much data. How to handle it? That's why actually big data research become a major issue it's here. There are lots of paper published. A lot of information gets published in journals which are not nature or science, or not a top professional journal. The issue is here. When there are so many papers published, how do you find what is good? So many people take a simple approach, okay, if it's published in Nature or Nature Family Journal, it's good. If it's published somewhere in a low impact factor journal, it's bad. It's not necessarily true, but again, uh, say, I gave you an example of our article in a, um, uh, this article in uh, Nature Materials. It's been cited in Web of Science about like a uh, 1,500 times a year. So it means it's like a five, pita five citations per rock day or six citations per rock day. And on graphene, there are probably 100 paper appears every day. No one can read all of them. I scroll through, I don't know, 20, 30 papers a day. 
I read maybe one in TPL every second day. How do we deal with a thousand paper appearing in a certain topic? Mm -hmm. How do we extract the image? How do we determine which paper is good, which is not good enough? That's why, you know, this uh, becomes so much important nowadays. People are uh, striving really to publish in top journal for a very simple reason. This is where paper will be noticed. And if it's published elsewhere, it may be noticed either much later or never, just because there is so much information. So I think uh, we don't need to be just a happy, you know, you know we have produced things electronically, we can store uh, terabytes of data online. It's useless unless we have access to those data. And this we have mechanism of just basically sieving through this data and find what we need. And we don't have it today. I think this is where the real challenge is. And I think we often need to push back because not everything what, uh, uh, say, NSF, DOE, uh, say to us is really good and correct. And again, I'm not afraid to uh, make my opinion known to uh, <laughs> program directors who fund me or don't fund me. Uh, I don't think it makes me more popular there. Uh, but again, I think uh, as a community, we also need to uh, protect some values and explain uh, to us that what is really important for science and for scientists and what simply takes time away. Because again, presenting and putting data online or in a repository takes time. It takes a lot of time. If we do this, we don't do something else. If we do this and no one can use it anyway, it means that it's simply wasted time to satisfy some bureaucrat. We will put a check mark and tell, okay, we made it all, they all deposit their data somewhere. So I think this is another very important issue here. Amount of time that I think scientists spend on various bureaucratic uh, activities has been over past uh, 20 years, certainly growing constantly. Do you think that there are an infrastructure around data that would be similar to the publishing industry? be reviewed, it be described, it be characterized, it be discoverable by all the... Do you think then it would be useful? I think it will be developed. Because often there is data, often, Other very things. often in science, we reproduce the same results. Are already done, or done by someone. And the reason is very simple. There is no good and easy way to find them. Because some results get published, some don't get published. Results which are not successful experiments don't get published usually. How do you find someone already done and show it doesn't work? There's no good way to do it. We just do it again and learn the same lesson. And again, this result gets buried somewhere. And there is progress, for example. PhD thesis was very difficult to access in the past uh, because this was uh, a volume stored somewhere <coughs> in the library, maybe in Africa, maybe in Australia, maybe elsewhere. How do you get it? You order it through interlibrary loan, someone copied, sends, here. Now it's all pretty much electronic. So it's much easier. So certain piece of information become accessible. You can get the data, you can go to look at supplementary information, look for address of repositories, things here. But again, it's still far from being easily accessible. It's still far from a state that we can tell, okay, look, we want to do this experiment. Here are a few keywords, here's a brief description who has done it in the past, who has any data produced in this experience. I don't know a way to access this information. I think this is what needs to be built up from. Way of accessing it, make information searchable, and then the data will become useful. Well, perhaps we should uh, thank Yuri for, for his talk. And if you have any other questions, there's still, I believe, some uh, additional food and drink left for a few minutes. And so I am a Drexel. Uh, I'm accessible, uh, reachable. My email uh, was somewhere at the last uh, slide right here, or at least the website uh, address uh, here. We're at nana.materials.drexel.edu. And there is uh, a lot of information about what we're doing. Again, we're I wanted to thank uh, the NUTA for this invitation. Uh, I want to thank all the library staff for organizing this event. I want to specifically uh, thank uh, Jay Matt, who has been a 
a uh, great support this uh, engineering librarian over a long period of time, pretty much from the beginning of my uh, tenure at Drexel University. And uh, many of my students really, really benefited uh, uh, from uh, all the knowledge uh, that, uh, and all the support uh, we received uh, from Jay. Uh, well, thank so you. Again, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay.